What's up, everybody? My name's Adam McDorman, and this is American Literature. Now, this week, we're going to finish our first unit by taking a look at texts from the American Revolution. And in fact, we're going to take a look at four short excerpts from two different authors. We're going to look at Patrick Henry's speech to the Second Virginia Convention, which is often referred to as the Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, and three excerpts from Thomas Paine's varied writing career, starting with an excerpt from Common Sense, a few excerpts from The American Crisis, Volumes 1, 2, and the last one, Volume 13, and then finally, an excerpt from The Age of Reason, which is a very controversial text. As always, the best way for us to get the most out of these various excerpts is to know a little bit about the authors themselves, to have some sense of the historical context that surrounds these various readings, to take a look at a few key literary features of these texts, and of course, as always, we will finish by framing a few big ideas that we will use as a lens through which to view these texts. Just a quick note as we jump into this, I'm presenting this information under the assumption that you have already, or are currently, or are about to learn about the American Revolution in your U.S. history class. So we'll keep some of the uh, biographical and historical information kind of at a top level, a quick flyover just to remind you of the backdrop against which these texts were written. Patrick Henry lived from 1736 to 1799. He was a self-taught lawyer and served in the Virginia House of Burgesses, which is essentially uh, part of the colony's legislative system. Patrick Henry was a very gifted speaker and well known for his ability to capture his audience's attention, to speak with passion, and persuade them to join whatever cause he was discussing. Uh, that factors in really heavily to his speech to the Second Virginia Convention. Thomas Paine lived from 1737 to 1809. He was actually born in England and decided to move to America after some convincing uh, on the part of Benjamin Franklin. And when he arrived in 1774, he became the editor of Pennsylvania Magazine. And for about the first two years of his time as the editor, uh, he stayed out of the political conflict that was brewing between the American colonies and Great Britain. Uh, and then he joined that public debate when he released Common Sense, which seems to have been almost single-handedly responsible for uniting the average citizen against Great Britain leading up to the Revolutionary War. Much, much later, he writes this very controversial book called The Age of Reason, and he ends up being despised by the very people that he convinced to join the revolution. Very interesting. We'll take a few steps back from that point and talk about what actually leads up to the American Revolution. Again, assuming that you're going to get into this in more detail in your U.S. history class. Now, the 13 colonies that made up what would have been the United States at the time were rapidly growing. Think back to our last video where we looked at how the number of European colonizers is rapidly exploding uh, population-wise. Well, there was a need to expand westward. Meanwhile, France occupies uh, what is now Canada, and they had a need to expand to the south. Unsurprisingly, this is eventually going to result in some, some major conflict, thus the French and Indian War, which lasted from about 1754 to 1763. Great Britain won the French and Indian War, but there were a couple of key lasting effects that would precipitate further conflict in the colonies. The first one is that there were many British troops that remained quartered in the colonies. That meant that they were occupying people's houses, essentially, and that caused, obviously, resentment among the colonies toward Great Britain. And perhaps even more infuriating was the fact that Great Britain racked up an enormous amount of debt fighting the French and Indian War. And as a result of that, they begin taxing colonists 
heavily. And for about the next 12 years after that, the relationship between the 13 colonies and Great Britain is is damaged, it's broken. That essentially splits the colonists into two separate groups. There are a group called the Patriots who are pushing for independence. They see the relationship between the colonies and Great Britain as, as irreparably damaged, that there's no way to fix this. And on the other hand, you have loyalists who go on to be called Tories later on, who want to continue to pursue their rights as British citizens through official means. They want representation. And if you think about it, this is kind of a disagreement about what phase of colonization these American colonies are in. Let's take a step back and remind ourselves of what those phases are. Phase one of colonization is discovering. Now that's when wealthy nations fund these exploratory expeditions to find and claim territory. They would gather information and return home. Phase two is settling, and that's when teams of sturdy and resourceful people return to attempt to build a more permanent settlement. And finally, we have phase three, which is thriving. In a phase three colony, the settlers have mastered the countryside and transformed their settlement into a self-sustaining town or city. They're no longer reliant on resources and manpower from their home country, and as a result, they, they stop being a draw or a net negative on the resources and becomes a net positive. A, a place of opportunity, if you will. Safe places to live and work are established. There's a potential for wealth, adventure, freedom, possibly even just a fresh start for anybody who wants to come over. And those new opportunities aren't simply reserved for the kinds of strong and sturdy people who settled that place in the beginning. In fact, one of the signs that you've entered into the third phase of colonization is that people begin having children and the older generation passes away and the people who primarily occupy a space don't even remember how difficult things were in phase two. And on top of all of that, normal people such as laborers or tradesmen begin immigrating to live, work, and have families there from other places. So if you think about it, Great Britain and the Loyalists would probably come out of the other side of the French and Indian War seeing the colonies as a significant net negative on their resources. I mean, they had racked up all this debt and that the colonies should try to work things out with their mother country because they're still reliant on, on support from Great Britain. That certainly seems like a phase two colony. And perhaps the Patriots are looking at this whole scenario thinking, well, if they're going to make us pay for this whole thing, I guess that means that we are an output of wealth. And that makes us very much a phase three colony that can stand on its own and has no need for monetary support from an outside nation. In fact, it's them who is stealing from us. The thing about it is this debate is largely taking place among the elite. And it seems to me at least that the average citizen is far less interested in taking up arms and waging war against the king and Great Britain. People like Patrick Henry and our boy Thomas Paine worked very hard to convince the loyalists to join their cause. And that leads us to the Revolutionary War. But we're not really going to spend too much time talking about the events of the Revolutionary War. Rather, we're going to take a look at the literary tradition that surrounds it. I mean, coming out of a phase two civilization, the literature is still very pragmatic. Nobody's writing fairy tales and folklore yet. It's, it's still about persuading people's hearts and minds and writing about what's going on. And, and you'll see that in this week's readings. So let's actually take a look at some of the key literary features of the text for this week. The first one is Patrick Henry's speech, the Second Virginia Convention, commonly known as Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death. You're going to look at the entirety of this short speech. Notice the words I'm using there. This is a speech, not a sermon, not a story, not a poem. It's not a myth. This is a speech. And the purpose of this speech is to convince the listener 
So your goal as a reader should be to identify Patrick Henry's claim and his supporting evidence. If you can do that, then you can begin to decide whether you agree or disagree with the points that he's making. The next two excerpts are going to be from Thomas Paine's Common Sense and a few volumes of his American Crisis. The Common Sense was a pamphlet that was written with the purpose of persuading the average citizen to join the cause and take up arms against Great Britain. The American Crisis came shortly after that, and its purpose was, was largely similar, right? It was a series of 13 pamphlets published from 1776 to 1783, and its purpose was to keep morale high among the common people who were fighting so that they would stay motivated to continue to fight against Great Britain. The audience was the same for both of these texts. It was the common man, average people. Uh, and it may not be immediately apparent when you actually read this, but the tone and style of these two texts, even though they're talking about similar subject matter, that tone and style is, is quite different than Patrick Henry, who's speaking to uh, politicians, people who are educated. And the last text that you'll look at is a short excerpt from Thomas Paine's The Age of Reason. And this one's a little bit different. The Age of Reason was a book that didn't deal with the events of the Revolutionary War really at all. In fact, it argued on behalf of, of a deistic view of the world. So it did things like highlighting corruption in the Christian church, especially in their pursuit of political power. Um, it advocated for reason over revelation. Uh, it encouraged a belief in God but it denied the divinity of Christ, as well as arguing against the divine inspiration of the Bible. Among other common arguments that you can read about on Wikipedia, if you so choose. This is by far the most controversial text that we'll look at this week. And part of what makes it so controversial is the fact that Thomas Paine is taking arguments that the learned elite are having about their faith and repackaging them and unleashing them amongst the common people. Uh, and he ends up being despised because of his desire to make this, you know, high knowledge available to normal people. I mean, certainly there's plenty of reason for us to disagree with Paine and some of the conclusions that he comes to here, but it's, it's kind of sad that someone who united so many people under a common cause could be so quickly rejected by those very same people. About 12 years after the final part of this book was released, Thomas Paine passed away, and one of the obituaries that was written about him said, he had lived long, did some good, and much harm, and only six people came to his funeral. I mean, gosh, it's so anticlimactic, isn't it? And speaking of things being anticlimactic, let's finish by looking at a few big ideas through which to view this text. And really, there are two main questions that I want to ask here. The first is, is kind of general. Under what circumstances, if any, is rebellion and revolution justifiable? And secondly, who was the American Revolution actually for? When the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776, it said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it takes almost a hundred years for us to even begin making good on that promise with the Emancipation Proclamation that frees the slave, and even longer after that for the 19th Amendment to actually give women the right to vote. I mean, who was this written for? Who were they talking about? I mean, it certainly wasn't everyone. What did they mean by that? Who was this fight actually for? I mean, they had to work really hard to even convince the common man to rise up and join them. Many of the people that were involved in the American Revolution over the past few years have had their legacies come under scrutiny. Perhaps because people are asking this very same question and looking at, well, the people who are left out of that statement. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. 
And that's gonna do it for this video, guys. I hope that you take the time to engage all four of these excerpts, which are fairly short, with a degree of scrutiny, that you come to them with your thinking cap on and actually consider the points that they're making, who they're speaking to, what their ultimate goals are. And I'm sure that that will lead to some very interesting discussions when we get together and talk about these very soon. Until next time, guys, good luck, have fun, what a time to be alive.